Mr. Martin is in a world of hurt. He's in bad, bad shape. He needs surgery. It's just horrible. This thing, it's been through the ringer. <laughs> It's, but it's just still in pretty good shape, don't get me wrong. It's just that it needs a lot of TLC. Uh, the back is cracked in several places here. The top, according to the story, was replaced by the factory back in the 60s. Now, I don't know, maybe it was the factory that did it and maybe not, I don't know. I would say the top has been replaced, that part probably checks out. Whoever did it, did a pretty good job on that. The binding, to me, I don't think this binding is standard. It's really wide uh, binding and I don't know, it just doesn't look standard to me. It's a D28. When they took the top off of it, they, uh, the customer noted that they cut straight through the 14th fret here and just popped this off and you know put a new top on it then and then just put this back on, which is not a horrible way to do it. I mean that little minor cut down through there, you know, I mean to some people it's the biggest deal in the world. I mean I had a customer that just read me the riot act when I did that on a mandolin and he's still, 20 years later, is still upset about it. To me it's it saves a, you know, a lot of time, a lot of effort, which translates to a lot of money savings and all you get out of it, the only negative is you just got a little tiny line right there. Some people though uh, just feel differently about those things. So if Martin did that at the factory and if they did that then that it was one of their standard practices and that's where I read about it years ago and that's why I did it to that particular customer's mandolin many 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 years ago. I don't do that anymore. If I have to take one off now because that customer and the fit that he threw and still throwing I take off the whole fretboard. Even though it ten times more work and you know and it potentially causes way more damage because you're going all the way down the neck here and you got to pop it loose everywhere so whatever uh, I'm off that rant we got to fix this bridge here uh, we're not going to fix it with the piece that broke off of there we're going to fix it the customer provided a new bridge and we may use the new bridge or I may make him a custom bridge to, to fit it better. Whoever replaced this bridge, and the bridge was replaced, and I don't think this was factory. Uh, they drilled holes through it here and put bolts in it. Not a good idea. The reason that uh, this broke, I'm not 100% sure of, because it didn't break you know, in the saddle line, uh, which a lot of them break in the saddle line. Well, this one didn't. It broke through the uh, holes here drilled in uh, for the pegs, which is another weak point in the bridge. But I'm still not quite sure why it broke like that. So we're going to investigate the inside of the guitar and see if we can learn anything about that. But Mr. Martin needs surgery, and we're going to take him in the OR right now. Maybe you can see the bridge plate in there. What I'm seeing is that the bridge plate is extra small and they did put screws through there and when I say screws I literally mean screws. They did not put a machine bolt with a nut. They literally put a screw from here down through there and expected that to hold something. And I guess it did because this part didn't come off. Maybe they know more than I do. That bridge plate it looks in good shape, but it's very small. You know, the top looks flat, so maybe it's fine. I don't know. We won't know until we string it back up, I guess, and see what kind of action the top gives us if the top pulls up or whatever. But generally, when I see a bridge plate that small, I expect trouble. All the braces look fine as far as I can tell. I don't see any braces broken loose in there, so... Um, I guess we're just going to get this piece off of here and clean it up and put a new one on. Okay, this has been filled with wood filler. I just have a awl here and I'm just going to pick it out of there if I can. Uh, very hard. Very hard stuff. Wow, it's really hard. Harder than I thought it would be. I thought it would just crumble. 
I don't know yet whether we're dealing with a Phillips or a regular head screw. That stuff's hard. I have to get the Dremel tool and cut that. No, it's a regular head screw. Well, if you've watched any of my videos where I've worked on bridges, I'll give you a hundred guesses whether I'm going to put that screw back or not, and the first 99 don't count. Like I said, it's just a regular screw, just a wood screw. There you go. I think that might be the first time I've seen that. I doubt it. I've probably seen it before and just don't remember it. Pretty much seen everything. Okay, maybe we'll get lucky and get this one out too. Yep, it's coming right out. I was afraid they'd be stripped in the hole and wouldn't back out. Now if we could just get lucky and have the bridge be loose enough to come off. But that doesn't look to be the case. Let's just see if we can pop it loose anywhere or find a loose spot. Well, there is a loose spot here at least. That's good, a good sign. Aha! I had a feeling it was just going to pop loose clean, and it did. Perfectly clean. Yeah, you can see a little wood fiber there, but that we're talking microscopic thin. It's nothing to concern anything with. And it actually came off cleaner than this part, I think. Before we do anything, we're going to have to find the intonation. So we're going to have to set up a rig to check intonation on this, and then... Uh, see what kind of uh, coverage we're going to get with this new bridge. The new bridge just isn't big enough really in a way. I mean it is but it isn't. It's It leaves a little tiny gap around there. So unless the intonation is absolutely perfect right there we'll probably have to make a new bridge. Before I get into the intonation I noticed that this crack here does seem to go all the way through. It does move and this crack here seems like it has a little bit of movement in it. They're pretty good bangs. So I'm going to take the super glue, the very fine viscosity, very thin viscosity super glue, and I have my little pipette here. And I've kind of developed a technique. I don't recommend you try this unless you've practiced a lot. Because this stuff runs everywhere, but with this little tiny pipette, for whatever reason, I can control the flow of this stuff so much better than anything else I've tried. And it's soaking down in there and going in that crack like crazy, I can see it. And this hole here is pretty big and pretty deep, so I'm just going to go ahead and fill it. I just barely put any pressure on this bulb up here. You can control how much super glue is coming out. I mean, you barely touch it. And it's cr going right down in that crack. Looks good. That's the one thing about this really thin super glue is you don't have to make it get in a crack. <laughs> it just goes in the crack. Um, it's gone in this crack so much that this uh, inside here, I'm afraid to touch it inside there with my finger. I'm afraid I'll glue my finger inside. I'm going to look in there and see if there's, if it's running through. Wipe it off with this rag in case it ran through. I don't see any evidence of that. After you let that super glue set this long, you can spray it with this accelerator. Um, it doesn't turn white after you let it set this long. If you spray it right away, it turns white, foams up, gets just ignorant. But this will just go ahead and make it set up so that we can go ahead and fill the hole. Otherwise, we'll be here half a day waiting for it to set up and you notice there's no white or anything happening there if you wait if you wait a little while even though the super glue hasn't cured if you wait a while before you spray it you're good I'm gonna go back through there now we're gonna see if we can get it to fill the hole now hopefully it sealed it with the first application this is a pretty deep hole right here this is almost all the way through the top I'm trying to more or less seal the finish at this point. There's a tiny dent that I'm sure is related to this one right here. Just put a drop there and I think that's going to be it on that. Again, I really caution you against doing what I just did unless you've practiced because let me tell you that stuff runs everywhere and it can ruin your finish so fast that 
it's hard to explain. So proceed with caution, my friend. And the other thing I've learned is you can reuse these pipettes many, many, many times with super glue if you make sure you squeeze it out real good and then turn it up, up like this, squeeze all, squeeze it a bunch of times. And basically what you're really doing is you're sucking the stuff out of there. You, you're sucking it back down into the bigger part of the tube is really what it amounts to. And if you leave it like that, and, and after you've really done that a bunch of times, and then leave it set like this in this position, then you'll be able to reuse that again the next time you need it. And I've done, I've reused this one five or six times already. And ordinarily with these things, one use is all you get. So if you do that, you can reuse these a bunch of times. Okay, that's setting up pretty good, it looks like. I think it's hard. This one here may not be hard yet, the, the new one that I did, the little dot. That one didn't sink in either, so it, we'll have to clean those up a little bit now. They're a little bit proud of the surface now, which is fine. Set, we're going to go ahead and set up the um, intonation rig now and see what we end up right here. Okay, you can see my little intonation rig I use. I've got the two strings tied on way back here. I just have the bridge sitting here floating. I put a temporary saddle inside here just to hold the strings up. And I have it tuned to E. I have not checked the intonation yet. I, I let you see it here at the same time as I do it. Um, hopefully I can see it too. <laughs> All right, there's your E. And then if I note it, it's flat. So that means it's too far back. That means the saddle is too far back that way. Okay, here's the, the little E. It's in tune and it's flat also again that means that it's too far back so if anything it's got to come forward which I didn't expect that I have to be honest I'm sliding it forward as much as I can at the moment I I put some temporary bridge pins in here just to kind of help hold it in place I don't need them so I'm going to take them back out so if anything I've got to move this forward now the bad thing about that is we're getting really close to the pick guard here get by with that that's pretty close too okay the reason I don't really want to move the bridge any more than that is because we're getting really close to the pick guard here for one thing and it's just gonna look bad secondarily uh, you know we're leaving a bigger gap here in the back uh, we've already got a gap there of almost an eighth of an inch on this side and about a sixteenth of an inch on this side. A little bit more here than on this side, but not much. And the bridge looks fairly straight on the guitar, so I don't see a problem there. In other words, I don't think I have it cocked this way or that way. I think, I mean, we could get by with this, and I think I'll contact the customer and see what he says. Making a new bridge is going to cost more money, obviously, because it takes more time and the materials. Or if he would rather just live with the little minor disease back here and uh, put it on where it's at. I'll check with him and we'll get back to you. I made one quick phone call to the customer and he wants this to be the be-all, end-all, fix-all time. He doesn't want to have to work on this thing ever again. <laughs> okay, well that's... Uh, that's a pretty big order, but I'm pretty sure we're going to give him a 50-year repair here at least. So he does want a new bridge so that it covers this area. The new bridge, uh, being just slightly bigger, just gives you that much more glue surface too. So, you know, you just, and it just helps on that pulling. So it just gives you that much more leverage. I think it's the way to go. That's what I would do if it was mine, and that's what he wants done. So... Uh, we are going to go ahead and make a custom bridge just a little bigger. question is how much bigger. And so what I'm going to try to do here is measure that and see how much bigger. Okay, we're on zero, and I'm going to try to just estimate how much bigger we're talking here. I'm going to put it on an eighth of an inch, and that looks pretty close to what we've got right here. I would say that's just about what we have there on this side we have less 
I think I'm just going to go ahead and make it 120 thousandths bigger all the way around. That's just 5 thousandths less than an eighth of an inch. We'll use this one as a pattern. We'll draw the straight line across here and these lines here and then what we'll do is we'll move it that way 120 thousandths across the front and then draw the back. That's just how simple it is. It's not very complicated. Okay, the way we're going to do this, we've got a real beautiful piece of rosewood here, very nice piece of wood. And the grain is cutting, you know, coming across the piece of wood at a little bit of an angle. So I'm going to turn this to match the angle so that the grain is, you know, pretty straight across the bridge. I'm going to draw three sides here. Okay, and now that I've got the three sides drawn, all we're going to do is move up about a roughly an eighth of an inch and I'm just going to use my calipers here as my guide and just by eye I'm going to make it about even all the way across there. And the trick is holding it still where it doesn't move when I draw the second part. That'll be a slightly oversized bridge. You know we're going to make sure in this case because we've made it so much bigger we're going to take every bit of the pencil mark you know so we're going to sand it until we just see the pencil mark disappear then we'll know we're the exact right size the dust on this rosewood is very toxic all wood dust is toxic so i'm definitely wearing my respirator i'm putting it on right now Ever since the days of old, man has searched for wealth untold. They dig for silver, pan for gold, and leave the empty hole. Way down south in the Everglades, where the black waters roll and the salt grass sways, the eagles fly and the otters play in the land of the Seminole. Okay, I rough sawed out the blank. I've flattened this one edge with the sander real smooth and perfect. This top surface is smooth and perfect. Now I'm going to take and set it down on the tabletop like this. I'm going to draw the ends back on here. And sorry, but you're not going to be able to see this very well. But it's not as important as me seeing it. I've already measured this saddle and it's exactly 120 thousandths. I'm going to set the saddle on the table right there put this on there so now we've got a nice 120 thousandths on the money and then I'm going to redraw retrace my outline here and so now I'll just take and sand all this down to this outline and we'll have a uh, perfect bridge that'll fit real real good blow, 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 send no wind blow like you're never gonna blow again Calling to you like a long lost friend, but I know who you are. And blow, blow from the Okeechobee, all the way up to Mekinope. Across the home of the Seminole, the alligator and the gar. We've got the blank real nice and roughed out. Um, we're going to have to, you know, round off all the corners and all that yet. Uh, just checking the specs on it though, uh, this one is 152.53 thousandths, this one is 151 thousandths, so we're talking you know, like two thousandths difference. That's almost immeasurable. I think I'll just take it in there on the uh, disc sander and round this off. And then I'll take it to the oscillating sander and I'll round off these corners too and uh, we'll knock these edges off a little bit too. Just want to get it where it's not sharp on the edges. Progress came and took its toll And in the name of flood control They made their plans and they drained the land to go and drag. What I'm going to do is center this bridge in the new bridge and then draw where the holes are going to be. 
That moves them back just a little bit from the front edge, yet not so far back that it changes the dynamic much. Um, anyway, that's how I'm electing to do it. There's, you could do it a lot of different ways. Okay, and now I'll just put a jig over the top of that, clamp it down, and we'll drill those holes. We've got this uh, drill jig uh, clamped up onto the bridge uh, that uh, my customer buddy Tom sent to me. Thank you very much, Tom. I have a brad point bit in here, and ordinarily you wouldn't use a brad point bit for a jig. However, this brad point bit has those real sharp cutting edges on the on the bottom and it doesn't tear out so I'm going to use that I believe it'll be just fine I just want to make sure I get it lined up real good so I don't tear up my edge before I turn this on that did a real nice job we'll line up the next couple here we think we can get one or two more before we have to reclamp Got the little pin that he gave me, uh, uh, that he sent along with this. I'm going to line that up just so that nothing moves. And I think we can get maybe two more holes drilled if we're lucky. I have realigned the uh, jig and the pins and we're ready to cut the last two holes. Okay, I think we've got a real good clean job there. <sighs> Looks real good. We've got the countersink bit in here now and we will countersink all these. I think I've got a good stop set, but we'll see. We may have to adjust that. We're gonna have to go just a little bit deeper, not much. I'm hoping I can adjust it with my little gauge right on this machine here. I don't know if I can or not. Okay, I've adjusted it just very slight amount. We've made a good blank here. Uh, turned out real nice. Got it all beveled there and uh, rounded off around everything. Uh, the back was really glass smooth and I cleaned it with acetone and then I scratched it with this tooth blade. I've already done the scratching just like this. Now I'm going to clean it one more time with acetone and then I'm going to see how it fits up on the guitar top. Okay, not that I needed to do this, but just as a sanity check, I put a, a temporary saddle under there, under this uh, new bridge and just checked it and uh, the intonation's really good. So we're gonna have plenty of room to route a new slot in here. I just wanted to make sure that it was covering the area and that we'll, that we'll have plenty of room. So really what we need to do now is uh, just fix it in place and glue it in place. What I'm gonna do is trace around it like I always do. I wanna line it up real good first to make sure that we're lined up with the center line of the guitar where I can almost line it up I, I think I can actually line it up with the original holes and still cover everything and then that that saves stress on the top there too it looks just fine yeah I think I'm gonna do that I, it's it's lined up with the original holes now I'm just gonna go ahead and trace around it we will uh, remove all that finish that's in the area there when I trace around them, I like to have a fresh blade in my X-Acto knife, and I do. It's a brand new blade, and that really gives you a real fine, delicate line. I'm going to try to hold this, keep it from moving. As a matter of fact, one of the better ways to help keep it from moving is just to go ahead and insert the two pins on the ends, and then it's less likely to move, or a little less likely. Now I've got to trace around this without letting it move. Last time I walked in the swamp, I stood upon a cypress stump. I listened close and I heard the ghost of Osceola cry. Okay, we should be able to take it off there now and see our lines. I sure hope so anyway. Now that's perfect. That's just perfect. It left a little bit on all sides to remove a little bit of finish and it'll, it'll work out real good. Time to pick the finish out of the marked area. 
Also want to clean off the old glue and the old finish that's inside here. It's really just glue. Well, I guess I'm just really getting forgetful on this camera thing. I forgot to turn the camera on. I went ahead and cleaned the rest of that off as you saw me start there. Got interrupted and then I never did get back to it that day. I'm on another day now. And I forgot to turn the camera back on. So there you go. But anyway, it's cleaned off. It's flattened out. And uh, this is cleaned and flattened and also uh, scraped a little bit. So I think we're ready to glue her on there. You can probably see there's a line here and a line here that goes around like so. And uh, those lines, I think, were probably from some sort of a pick guard that was on above. Um, I'm going to try, I've got 600 grit here, and I'm just going to see if we can sand those lines away, and then we'll buff it back out. Actually, now that I think about it, I'm going to try removing it with some liquid here first. See if... Uh, Let's see if the cigarette lighter fluid will, uh, if the lighter fluid will get rid of that, some of that. I don't know if it will or not. Kind of don't think so. I'm thinking there might be a residue, a glue or something, and maybe we can get rid of some of it before we sand it. It's helping maybe a tiny, tiny bit. I don't feel it as much. It was, you could actually feel it really a lot before. That's helping on that. Clean that up and make it look better. It just looks bad. And I can't really say that helped all that much, but it didn't hurt anything. Still feel it up here where it's really heavy. But anyway, we'll try getting rid of some of that. Try to blend it out of there. I think if we... Uh, play our cards right, we can get rid of a whole lot of that look and, and it'll look better. Yeah, getting rid of some of it, but it's, it's a tough, tough call. There's a lot of junk there. We're starting with the 600 and we'll go to finer grits here once we get as much of it gone as we think we're going to get gone. That helped a lot right there that time. A lot of it disappeared. There's a lot of that you can't really see right up against the fretboard here, dark. So I'm going to very lightly scratch the top of that with this X-Acto to see if I can get some of that dark junk off of there. Trying not to get down to the finish. I'm just trying to scratch the top of that stuff off. Yeah, that helped a lot along there. It really looked nasty. Let's see if we can do anything with the finish in that area there. Yeah, that looks pretty good compared to where we were. That's about all I feel comfortable sanding. Um, I can see here where the finish puckered underneath whatever that was. It kind of puckered the finish up right there. I'm going to see if I can get a little bit more of that out. As I'm working on this in detail, I'm noticing another little problem, and you probably will have a tough time seeing this, but right at the edge of the pick guard here, it's pulled up, and there's a crack that goes underneath this and probably starts right here, and I can see the crack. I think I can get that thin glue to just run down in there and fill that crack, and that's what we're going to try to do. You can see the wood fibers lifted up in there. I don't know if it showed up on the video. Anyway, it'll be worth an effort. Okay, once again, I'm using that same dropper. Getting some glue in there. And very carefully drop it down in this crack. And I can see it running down the crack quite a ways this way. So it's, it's definitely a big crack. Bigger than I thought. Following the grain here, there's three or four of them that are opened up. And this will fix all that. And then I think this one here might be open too. Yeah, it is, and it's following it back underneath the bridge. You can even see it. So that's good to get glue in these cracks. That is really good stuff for getting into cracks that are way too tight to do anything else. If you can only afford one 
you know, thing of super glue, I would recommend the very thin viscosity because what you can do is you can seal a crack like that first and then you can fill it after it's sealed, after it dries, then you can go back and fill the crack with the thin stuff. The thick stuff is only really good for spanning gaps and filling. Um, so you can do both with the thin. So if your money's tight, I would just get the thin. Trust me, I've been there in my life where money was tight enough that I could have only afforded one type. Okay, it's been there. It's, it's been a little while, so I'm going to spritz it with this uh, accelerator. And it won't foam up now because it's been a while. And uh, that will make it get hard, and then I don't have to wait on it. There you go. I think that, I think that solved that problem. Don't see any movement there now. Okay, I'm going to take it to the buffing wheel and we're going to buff this area out and see what we can do about it, making that look better. I got a little ahead of myself. I said I was going to the buffing wheel, but I'm going to uh, use 1200 on it first, lightly over the whole area, just to kind of buff out the 600 scratches. Not that they, it doesn't leave many scratches, but. 1200 is even better. And I'm doing this dry. Um, I should, in a way, it would probably be better if I was doing it with wet. But uh, this wood, I, I'm afraid the water is going to get down underneath this finish because of uh, it's old and there's a lot of cracks and stuff. And So I'm just doing it dry. You can really do a lot more damage sometimes trying to do good. So... Even though it's harder to sand it dry, uh, you know, it's the lesser of the two possible evils. I really don't like sanding finishes dry. I really don't. But, like I said, it's safer than, on this particular case, than doing it wet. First of all, I don't even know what kind of finish this is. This could be a shellac, and if it's a shellac, it would turn milky white if you put water on it. Okay, I think we're good enough that we can buff that out real nice. I got ahead of myself yet again. I, I you know, I was just concentrating on this area and I was going to just buff this area out, but then I got to thinking I might as well buff out the whole top while I'm over there and uh, I'm just going to clean up these two areas here that we put glue in yesterday. So I've got my razor blade with tape on it here and uh, trying to just scrape off the high spots of the super glue. This one here is kind of puffed up. I'm just going to cut it off there and then scrape it. Blow, 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 send the wind blow like you're never going to blow again. I'm calling to you like a long lost friend, but I know who you are. And blow, blow from the Okeechobee. Not trying to make it perfect in this particular case. What I'm just trying to do is make sure that it looks better than it looked came in here and that it's solid. And the glue made it solid. And in my opinion, it looks better because you don't see the big gaping holes. All right, let's just buff it out and see how it looks. Across the home of the Seminole, the alligator and the gar. guitar's had its share of abuses, so you aren't going to make it look like brand new, but now it looks a little bit better cared for. Uh, not looking perfect by any stretch, but I feel a lot better about this top being solid now. We fixed quite a few cracks in it, and we've gotten rid of most of that line where that old pickguard area thing was, and uh, that, that makes it look better too. 
you don't see nearly as much as you did. You could see that from across the room before. Now you got to be up fairly close to really see it. Although there is a little bit of shading difference uh, from the sunlight, I guess, hitting it. Uh, it's a little lighter in this area than it is over in this area. So, you, And you can't fix that. So, All right. Um, I could go ahead and glue the bridge on there, but you know, I'm, while I was in there on the buffer, I was getting to see the back of this a little bit. You know, these, there's cracks all through this back. They don't appear to be loose. Um, I don't see movement in them. I'm going to try to look at it real critical here and uh, see if they've already been glued. It looks like they may have. I kind of see glue in there or something. or It's either glue or where the finish is just kind of curled up like that and it's hard to tell but since I don't see any movement I think they've been fixed what because they stick up what I think I'm gonna try is a little wet sanding on this back just a small area first to see if this finish is going to tolerate it see if we can get rid of, rid of some of this 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 whole back just doesn't feel right. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to clean it or try a lighter fluid and just clean it first because there's just it just feels kind of almost like sticky, uh, greasy like. Here's some white something smeared on it here, and I thought maybe the lighter fluid would take that off, but it doesn't. I don't see much coming off. There's a little bit of discoloration, but not much. Turning the rag over, wiping it dry here to get rid of the lighter fluid residue. Feels a little better, not quite as sticky. It's still a little bit sticky like. Don't know how to describe it other than just kind of wants to stick to you. Well, let's just see what we can do with a little bit of wet sanding. Got my little bowl of soapy water here. That's just dish soap. And that makes sanding so much easier. Can't even tell you. Well, that's getting rid of the white. So we're at least going to get rid of these white marks right off the bat. I can tell that. That's nice. Go over all these scratches because they just stick up so much that you can just feel them. And they just feel hideous. If we can at least make them smooth, they won't be so bad. Seems to be handling this wet sanding fine, so we're just going to go ahead and go for it. I'm just using 1200 on it, and uh, then we'll just buff it out from there. There's just a lot of very fine surface scratches going in all sorts of directions, and I thought this might get rid of a lot of that too. It won't I'm not going for perfection, just going for improvement. Wipe that off real quick and we'll get another dry towel and clean it off. Oh, it is turning a little white. It is turning a little white. Yeah, I was afraid of that. If we dry it off real good and uh, let it dry, it will should turn right back clear but so I'd say this finish is some sort of a shellac based finish that's probably why it's a little sticky too it's still turning a little bit milky white there I don't know if that'll show up in the camera or not but it is definitely a little bit milky that's not that big a deal people sweat on them and they turn bright and they turn just solid white and then they clear up later so I didn't do enough here, I don't think, to cause any permanent damage. We'll just uh, dry it like this. We'll set it in front of a fan to blow it off. And uh, it should turn back perfectly clear and then we'll buff it out. I think you can see that the top back buffed out pretty nicely. It's, uh, you know, it's not perfect and it's old and beat up, but uh, it looks much, much better. So now what I'm going to do... Um, these cracks, you know, they get uh, kind of like a white grit in them and stuff from sanding and all that kind of thing. So I'm just going to go down through here and just touch them up real lightly. So we'll just touch these up. I've got some dark brown dye and I'm, I've got a very fine paintbrush. And I'm trying to only touch the spots that are white. You can't do that, but it's you can get 
pretty accurate if you're careful. And then you can just take and wipe it off and buff it a little bit. And I think you can see the difference between that one there, which goes all the way through here, and this one here. So it definitely makes them look a lot better. Not perfect, but much, much better. And blow, blow from the Okeechobee, all the way up to Mickey Across the home of the Seminole, the alligator and the gull. obvious white ones I'm just touching up to so just to darken them up a little bit where they don't show here's a long crack a bit of hairline that's about as good as I'm gonna do with this sure does look better okay it's time to quit stalling and get this thing glued back on here I'm gonna try to do it so I don't get too much down in the holes. I'm going to put a call under this, and when you put a call in there, the uh, a backing call that is, um, you don't want to glue it in place. One, two, three, four. <laughs> in there and see if uh, any glue has come through those two screw holes. I don't think so. I'm hoping it doesn't. I'm looking down through there and lining up the holes as best I can because that's what we're kind of using as my lineup. I'm going to take some water and go down through these holes and try to clean them out a little bit because I don't want that glue squeezing out down into that call. There's not much squeeze out, but trying to avoid it. Okay, they look pretty good as far as lined up goes. Just stick those in there just temporarily. This finish being shellac, you got to be careful about getting it too wet, and it's already plenty wet, I can tell you. This finish don't like water. It's a, a shellac-based finish or something, and you can literally almost wash it off. It might be a, it might be a French polish finish. Uh, you know, a lot of people swear by those, uh, by those French polish things, but, but it's a shellac-based finish, and... If you get it wet, it's just not, it just don't like water. And so we're gonna have to buff this back out after we're done, but it'll be fine. It's just that it does make a mess on your finish. Just, just plain water. Okay, we're gonna have to let that set up and get good and hard. Mr. Martin's been sitting over the weekend, so it's, it's had plenty of time to really dry well, which is really a good thing, actually. So, We'll take the clamps out and we'll see what it looks like. Well, that's not good. The uh, call didn't fall right out. So the call did get just sort of, just a tinch of glue right in one of those screw hole joints. Not a big deal. That looks good. It's really solid looking. Don't think we're gonna have to worry about that bridge coming loose anymore. Sounds good and solid. I don't hear anything vibrating. So now we'll set up to cut the slot. You can see I have my little rig on here for intonation again. And uh, I have got the saddle set in the perfect place. Um, I spent, you know, a good amount of time checking it back and forth and made sure I got it just right. It looks like it's in a good spot on top of that. So we're going to go ahead and mark it. I'm going to mark both sides and I do it right underneath the string 
and then we just connect those lines and make straight lines and then we route out in between there and uh, we should be good to go. Before I set up to route out this slot, there's something else I want to get done on this thing. Uh, hopefully you can see in the video how dull these are. These are so tarnished, um, really bad. As a matter of fact, now I'm looking at them, I think they used to be gold. Um, they're that bad. I mean, that they look like they've, they've got a gold undercolor here, uh, which I did not see before. Uh, they're really bad. They're the worst tarnished tuning keys I believe I ever saw. So I'm going to take them out of here and see what we can do on my little buffer and see if we can make them look better. Okay, we got all the parts in here, very, very dull, very, very tarnished. We'll see what we can do with that. turned out in the other part of the shop then you saw me buff these out and I can tell you they look like a hundred times better they look so much better it's not even funny they they were so bad and now I'm just trying to get all the grit off of them now they have some sheen to them do I think it'll stay that way well probably a while quite you know Longer than you might expect, actually. That's pretty nice compared to where we started. Is it perfect? No. But again, it, it makes it look like a well-cared-for old instrument instead of a really something that almost looks like it was kept out in a shed because it was really tarnished. tuning key here is bent. Um, that probably it was probably in that position there and the guitar fell over and, and bent it. On a lot of tuning keys I can straighten them. I'm not sure I can on this one. I'm a little bit leery on this one. We'll take a look at that closer a little later. I don't see any bent ones on this side although this one might be a hair. More than likely this one was up there and it was just barely bent. You can tell the guitar has been leaned against the wall a lot because this is all rubbed off. It's, uh, it's beveled off a lot. It's not beveled off a little bit. You can see it's beveled off quite a, quite a bit there. So that's a good sign to me that it's been leaned up against something and when they get leaned up they fall over and that's what bends those tuning keys. I am putting all these in here before I tighten it up because sometimes it's hard to get them in there after you tighten them. Now I'll push them the rest of the way in with this little block of wood. Okay, this one is so bad that I would like to straighten it a little bit, but I tell you, you're really taking a chance when you're doing when you do straighten them. You really are, and I don't 
recommend you try this unless you've done it many times. I have done this many times. I've never broken one yet, but now that we're talking about it on video, here we go. Let's see what happens. Yep, that straightened it. Just almost perfect. Not, not perfect, but really a lot better than it was. This one's actually a hair bent too. But this one's less bent now than that one is. I'm not going to go any more on that one. I think I did a good job on there getting it close. I won't call it perfect, but it's definitely better. It's definitely improved. Okay, so now we'll get back to the business of cutting the slot in here. And then we'll do a fret job on this. First thing I'm going to do is extend the line all the way across there. I want to try to hold that really still so it doesn't move on me. And now I'll go ahead and draw the back line in there too. Sometimes it just helps to be able to see both lines and lining up the cutter. Okay, that looks good. Got a good parallel line there. And now we'll get the cutter out and see what we can do about cutting the slot. Okay, we made our first pass. I think I'm going to go ahead and make it a little bit deeper because it, it looks a little bit shallow to me, so I think I'm going to go at least another 50 thousandths deep. believe that's got her done we're gonna make us a saddle now to fit that slot you know I as I was filing that I thought I can feel that fret moving and I just reached down and picked it up with my fingers and pulled it right out now that's a first <laughs> so we'll have to figure out how to fix that this is where they took this apart at the 14th fret um, as, as you may recall in the earlier part of the video. So we'll have to uh, fix that. This slot is wallered out pretty big, so there's really no good way to hold that in there. I'm going to just attempt to super glue it, uh, which should work, and we'll give it a shot here. I'm going to run a little super glue in the hole first. Whoops. Not a very neat job there. Gonna run this fret down in there. If oh come on, <laughs> fret's not going in there this time. It went in every other time, no problem. I'm going to use sticks to push down on each end. I will take a little accelerator now after it's been a while and put that on there. All right, I'll, I'll give that a little bit of time to set up, and um, then we'll inspect it real close to make sure it's down in there all the way. Off camera, I took a little more time and uh, leveled the frets a little bit more, checked it with my good straight edge here, and uh, they're very good. I can look down and see that they're very good. Um, so now we're just going to recrown them. These frets seem to be kind of an in-between size. They seem to be smaller than the medium and bigger than the small, so I'm not sure how to re-round them here. Still got one pretty good notch right there, so I guess we're going to have to do some more leveling. That 600 really does a nice job polishing the frets. You can see how nasty the fretboard looks, but that's okay because we got to level all this fretboard anyway to get rid of some of these deep grooves. There's some really deep grooves in here. But the frets themselves, you can see, are just as slick as they can be. No problem whatsoever. This uh, fretboard, if it's ebony, it's... Uh, a strange color of ebony because as I scrape it, it's turning real brown. I don't know what the deal is there. 
It may just have a brown patch in the ebony. I'm not sure. We're not going to get the deepest grooves out of this, but we're going to get most of it out. Yeah, there's just a brown streak up through the ebony. That's what it is. Yeah, those are some really, really deep grooves. Man, I mean, very, very deep. You can try to fill them, but the problem with filling them is you can always see the fill. Most of the time, I just leave the hole because it was there already anyway. But at least it's much flatter, looks much better. It's just got a few small holes. Yeah, you can see the brown all the way through there. Kind of ties it into the brown back here. I will ask the customer if he wants it all dyed black or if he wants to leave it with the brown. So that we can get rid of this 14th fret cut, I'm filling this and then we'll dye this black. Filling all the little cracks right along the body line here where it shows that it was taken apart. And you won't hardly see this at all when I'm done. So you can probably see the little white line there on this side, the little fill white line. And we'll dye those black and you, you just, they'll just basically disappear. I talked to the customer. He decided to leave it natural color. So <clears throat> I'm doing that and I'm just oiling it with some lens, boiled linseed oil and uh, I'm just wiping it down. I'm drying it off now. I've, I put the oil on it a moment ago and I'm just cleaning it up. Makes it look really nice. I also oiled this spot here where the bare wood was showing through, uh, mostly just to kind of make it disappear a little bit. Looks real good. Pretty happy with it. It's time now to see what's going to happen when we string it up. So here we go. I'm choosing the J17 D'Addario strings for this guitar. I think they're going to make it sound real good. Uh, of course, that's a phosphor bronze, in case you're wondering. The uh, hesitation I have when I sight down the neck, looking from the nut up to the bridge and saddle, this looks high. i got to be honest with you. So I made it the same size as the one that was on there, but I think we're going to end up taking this all down and even planing this bridge down quite a bit, which that'll be fine because this is a pretty thick bridge at the moment. But I think we're going to have to lower everything down. Uh, for sure the saddle, uh, the bridge might be okay the height that it is, but for sure we're, I'm almost positive we're going to take this saddle down a long ways. But we won't know that for a fact until we get her strung up. You know, first things first, and that means I'm going to have to clean these holes out after gluing that on there. I didn't think about that, so we're going to have to work on that a little bit. That was painless. Did a nice job. It's a little risky, but the way to keep from chipping this out, or at least it helps it, is you have it pre-beveled, which I already did, and I also started the, bill, the drill spinning before it touched the wood. It seems to go in a little bit cleaner that way. At least it did on this one. I can't guarantee it'll do it on every one. Um, so anyway, let's see now if the uh, bridge pins will fit. Looks like they're going to be a pretty good fit. It's going to need a little bit of work. Uh, it's a little bit on the snug side right now, on this base one especially, because these big strings. All right, I'm not going to bore you with stringing this up. We'll bring you back when we get her strung. Okay, just putting the two strings on it, it's off the charts high here. Uh, there's not much point in even trying to measure it because it's just crazy high. And, uh, I mean, my thickest gauge that I have presently here is 130, and it's quite a bit higher than that. If I put the 70 on top of that, it will probably be close. Uh, we're probably 180 or 190 thousandths high there, so it's just crazy high. I'm going to take about, oh, 
roughly a hundred thousandths off of the bridge and just to get it down in the ballpark where it's more measurable. Okay, I'm going to open these calipers up to, oh, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to go to about a hundred and ten thousandths here. It doesn't really matter. And I'm going to scratch a mark on the bottom of this saddle. I'm, just, I'm going to use pencil lead here. I just to uh, mark this on both sides and then I'll take this and scratch the mark and you can see that way in the I can see where the scratch is in the pencil lead there it's not easy for you to see probably but there's a, a mark there so this is just crazy high we're gonna take it down we may have to cut some off of the bridge yet too because taking it down this much this bridge is probably gonna have to drop down a little bit I very quickly knocked a bunch off the bottom of this saddle. I don't know that I got a full hundred thousands off the bottom, but quite a bit. Now I'm going to just roughly check the action here at the 12th fret. It is, well, it's less than 120 now, which is good. It's 115 right here, or very close to that. And it's really close to 100 over here. So 115 and 100, we'll uh, decide how far down we want to take that. Doing some quick calculations, if I've got 115 thousandths at the 12th fret here, and I've got 100 thousandths here, I want to get this down to 90 and I want to get this down to 80. So that means that there's 25 thousandths too high here and 20 thousandths too high here. You double those numbers, that means I need to take 50 thousandths off on this side and 40 thousandths off on this side. Now, I can already tell this bridge is too tall to let me do that. So, first thing I'm going to do is take off some of this bridge, then we'll um, mark this and take it off of the saddle. Okay, in order to have some gauge as to how much we're taking off of here, I'm going to set the calipers at what we are right now and the easiest way to do that is you set this on here and you come down to your touch and it says 328 let me just do that again okay it says 343 I think that was a better measurement I'm going to do it one more time okay 338 so we're just going to call it 340 on this side here so I'll write that down 340 on the back side on the front side let me check it and see where we're at 347 let me just check it again just to make sure 357 it's really hard to get a good average on that so I'm just gonna call it 350 on that side which I think is what it really was anyway this side here's got a little taper in it because of the rounding over. That's probably why this side shows a little lower. But anyway, what we're going to do now, I'm going to take I want to take off uh, take this down to it's to where it's about 300,000. So in other words, I want to take about 50,000 off of this. That's quite a bit, but that's what we need to do. So we're going to take 50,000 off of this and I'm going to do that with my little finger planes. That's the only way I feel comfortable doing it. Other people might use a sander. I like using this because I can control this very well and I'm used to it. And if you're wondering how I'm gauging this, I'm just doing it by uh, experience, really. That's the only way I can tell you. I kind of have a feel for how much I'm taking off of here. My guess is this is probably going to read around 325 right now and that's just a total guess. So let's just see what it reads. Might read higher actually. 324.5. I was off by a thousandths. <laughs> so that ought to give you an idea that I understand my tool. I'm not bragging. I've just been using this thing for 30 years, so I, I know how much I'm taking off. So we want to take this down another 25 thousandths here. Okay, that's pretty good. Now I'm going to 
go take what I need off of this saddle. Again, I need 50 off this side, 40 off of that side. All right, now that we've got the saddle down and the bridge down, these we need to re-bevel these, so I'm going to bevel them with this beveling tool. I uh, beveled all the holes with that beveling tool on the drill, but it left, you know, it doesn't leave them very smooth, and I'm not very happy with that. I've cleaned this one and this one up, but the rest of these haven't been cleaned up yet. And the way I clean them up is I took a grinding stone for my Dremel tool, ran this against my grinding wheel, and beveled it out at a flatter angle. And then I can come in here and sand these edges smooth. Yeah, that looks much better. Yeah, that's a good idea right there. I, again, I just ran this against my grinder, spun it like that while I was running against the grinder to cut a flatter bevel on it. And uh, now that really smooths those out a lot, much nicer. Got the strings, two strings back on here just as a test now to see where we're at. And uh, at the 12th fret, here's the 90 thousandths. Boy, it's right on the money. Doesn't move at all. Um, let's see what the 80 thousandths looks like. Perfect. So we got 80 and 90. I think we're good. I'm going to go ahead and take this back off, clean this up a little bit more, get it oiled, and we'll string it up and see what she sounds like. Wiping the oil back off, getting it good and dry. Let's string this baby up and see what she sounds like. We got her all strung back up and uh, it's looking real good. I'm not going to lie to you, it raised the action just a little bit when we got all the tension on here, which I kind of expected it would, but it's not bad. Um, it's a hundred thousandths on this side right on the money and it's now 90 thousandths on this side right on the money. So that's acceptable in, in a bluegrass instrument and uh, you know, and, and, it's perfectly fine. Um, the action, it probably hasn't been that low in a very long time. The action up here at the nut is a very tight 18,000 sight. You can get the 18 in there, but it's, you got to kind of push it. So it's, it's probably closer to about 15,000 up here, which is really, really good. And it doesn't seem to buzz at all. Um, I'm real happy with this uh, Martin restoration here. The Martin was in the emergency room, but I think she came out far better than she went in. Well, friends, I'll tell you what, this is a very good sounding Martin guitar. It's a, it's a D28. The serial number is a 127378. It's a real nice old Martin guitar. Listen to how crisp it sounds. Got a nice sound. to put her back together and make her make her talk. I'm not much of a guitar picker so here's uh, a little Clayton Delaney, the old Tom T. Hall song. I remember the year that Clayton Delaney died. Well they said for the last two weeks that he suffered and cried. And it made a big impression on me though I was just a barefoot kid. Well, they said he got religion at the end, and I'm glad that he did. Oh, Clayton was the best guitar picker in our town. And I thought he was a hero, so I used to follow Clayton around. Oh, Clayton used to tell me, son, you ought to put the old guitar away. He said there ain't no money in it, it'll lead you to an early grave. Well, that's a good sounding Martin guitar. I'm pretty sure the owner's going to be tickled with this thing. I don't think it could uh, be in much better shape than it is right now. So it looks like a very well cared for old Martin guitar. Hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe, click the like button, and tell your friends. Thank you.